Welcome to the Nomad product keynote. I'm joined here with Arman, and in just a moment, Yishan's gonna join us to talk more about what we have in store for Nomad later this year. But to start out, I wanna talk about how Nomad has been on this journey for many years now towards a 1.0, and talk about what a 1.0 means for HashiCorp. I think a lot of our community expects us to release 1.0s much sooner than we generally do. I think the average time for us to get to a 1.0 for our products is around four years, maybe. Um, well, Nomad was released in 2015, and so I think it's a it's a very uh, it's very on topic to talk about what 1.0 looks like for Nomad today. To do that, I want to first talk about what is important in a 1.0 for us at HashiCorp generally across any of our products. We look for a number of different things uh, when when we talk about a 1.0. I think one of the first things we really look for is enough adoption and stability in that adoption. So people are really using it for a variety of use cases. Those use cases are stable um, and they're use cases that we do want to support for the product. Another thing we, we look for is architectural stability as well. So is the core design of the product itself uh, in a shape that we could support for years and years to come with limited breaking changes and feel comfortable doing that. In addition to that, the user experience of our products is super important. That's something we've always taken uh, taken to heart from a 0.1 for all our products. And so even if the product's super stable and it's used for a variety of use cases, if we feel we could really you know, smooth out some rough edges and make things more enjoyable to use, we like to do that ahead of time so that when we release a 1.0, and many users come and join the community, that they have a really good experience out of the box. And a lot of these things we look for in 1.0, they're, they're hard to define, they're hard to measure. And so a lot of people say, you've reached them years ago, or we're not quite there yet. As a team, we just ask ourselves with every release, are we ready to be 1.0 yet? And what does it look like to be 1.0? And we're getting there with Nomad, and Nishan's gonna talk more about that. Armand, do you have anything to add about, about 1.0s? No, I think that that largely covers it. I mean, I think the other piece that's sometimes hard for us to articulate is, you know, often we might have an, a, a sort of an idea of like what are all the use cases uh, for the product, but those use cases might not yet be sort of like well defined or or sort of polished in the product itself. And so I think what's tough is if you're only using the product for kind of that happy path and the use cases that we sort of do well support, you might say, yeah, this already feels like a 1.0 product. Like, what's HashiCorp waiting for? Versus sometimes there's these other use cases where we say, you know what, you know, when we first imagined this product, we thought about, you know, use cases A, B, and C as being kind of core to it. Yeah, we've really nailed A and B. Those are already at a 1.0 stage, but C is not quite there. Let's really kind of flesh that out before we consider the product, you know, truly a 1.0. So I think sometimes that's a little bit tough from the community aspect because you're using the tool, you feel like I've been using it in production, it does you know, task A really, really well, uh, but we have this bigger vision for a lot of our products and that's why it just takes them many years to get there. Yeah, and we've, we've talked about this before where even though a product is at 1.0 doesn't mean that it's not being used heavily in production or that we support it for production. Uh, Nomad is a great example of a product that we've sold to enterprises, sold uh, support contracts alongside of it, sold enterprise features alongside of it uh, for production use cases for many years, and yet it's you know not 1.0 yet, it's production ready. So I think a 1.0 for us is really, we view it as a commitment to our community that we've reached a very important milestone that we're committed to um, with a product. Well, and I think that point you made is also a really good one, which is I think part of that commitment is that we won't have breaking changes you know, immediately after that around those core use cases. So I think that's the other really key aspect is like, if we anticipate the need to introduce breaking changes, let's do that before we ship it and call it a 1.0 so that when we get there, there's this stronger promise of sort of forward compatibility. So I think that's a really good point is around that, that notion of what's the commitment we're making. Yep, and I, I think a lot of it is around staging, you know, staging up, staging the product for changes we want to make after 1.0, um, in a way where we don't need to make breaking changes to get there. So I think a good example with Nomad is actually introducing the uh, auto scaling capability that we had in the past couple releases. Uh, we weren't quite sure ahead of that auto scaling capability if it would require changes to Nomad that were were breaking, and so we just wanted to make sure to get the auto scaler in before 1.0, even though we didn't expect sort of the auto scaling functionality, for example, to reach 1.0 quality alongside Nomad. Yeah, I think that's a great example of the type of use case where we always imagine auto scaling 
would be a part of the original sort of vision for the 1.0 product. You know, you might say you didn't need the auto scaler and that we could have gone, you know, 1.0 with earlier release, but I think that's a great example of like a piece that we always imagined as being part of a, a 1.0 deliverable. So as a company, uh, we publish a lot of principles. We have something called the Tau and we have something called the HashiCorp principles uh, that both define how we build our products as, as well as how we interact with each other in our community. I think it's worth talking about, if you would, Armand, how we look at these principles in the Tau uh, and how they impact our product development with Nomad in particular. Yeah, I mean, I think we talk a lot about both these documents and I really think that they do guide a lot of the design and, and the behavior at HashiCorp. So when we talk about the Tau of HashiCorp, it's really the sort of core design ethos, right? How do we think about the problem itself, right? So whether it's kind of this notion of workflow over technology, meaning really what Nomad cares about is that workflow of when you say, you know, defining a job file, the CLI interaction, the UI interaction, all of that workflow is kind of the same, whether you're deploying a Docker container to the cloud or whether you're deploying a VM image on premise, right? So that technology, the underlying piece of it is sort of pluggable, but the workflow on top uh, is really what we focus on as, as the consistent layer. So there's a bunch of other elements within the Tau. The Tau really focuses on our design ethos, which is kind of common across all of the tools. I think the principles is sort of a different one, which is also interesting. The principles of HashiCorp are really meant to drive less of technical design decisions and more of sort of the human decision making. How do we sort of act as people and how do our sort of processes reflect that internally? And so I think when we talk about, you know, how do the HashiCorp principles apply to a 1.0 or apply to sort of a product like Nomad, you know, I think there's a few different pieces of it. Not all of them apply, but certainly some of them do, right? I think one big piece of it is vision, right? So when we talk about vision as part of the principles of HashiCorp, the idea is if we don't have sort of a destination in mind, if we don't have a kind of a clear picture of here's where we're going as a group, then it's really hard to rally around, right? Especially if you talk about a large group, including our customers, our community, our internal developers, et cetera. How do we rally everyone around a common vision of where the product is going, right? So I think part of that is just the destination setting. Uh, and I think, you know, having that vision of, hey, when we get to a 1.0, this includes A, B, and C, let's say, as core use cases. So that's kind of piece one. I think a second piece of it is pragmatism, right? How to be super practical, great, when we started Nomad five years ago, right? Or really, I think I should say we released it five years ago. We started it six years ago. You know, you have to be pragmatic and say, great, you have this grand vision for what the product should be when it gets to 1.0. Practically speaking, it's going to take you years and years of development to achieve that. So where can we start to add value right away? Where can we be pragmatic about evolving and growing the product over time to kind of get to that 1.0, but realizing that it takes kind of the fullness of time uh, to really get there, right? And this has been true with all of our products. And then I think what this ties back into kind of is to Mitchell's point is HashiCorp tends to be sort of unconventional in terms of how long it takes us to get to a 1.0, right? I think we sort of pride ourselves on it means something. I think we see a lot of, you know, folks in the ecosystem that treat a 1.0 as, you know, the software compiles, call it 1.0, versus for us, I think this speaks to our principle of integrity, right? Does it show and demonstrate intellectual integrity if we call a product a 1.0, if we don't feel like it's robust, if we don't feel like the architecture is stable, if we don't think, you know, there aren't future breaking changes? So I think integrity is also kind of a really key part of it of, you know, an intellectual integrity and honesty of, no, this thing just isn't a 1.0 yet. You know, here's the bar, here's how we're going to get there pragmatically. And I think then the last piece of it is reflection, right? And I think reflection is a huge part of our principles, which is how do we actively challenge ourselves? And to Mitchell's point, with every release, right, we ask ourselves, is this 1.0 ready? If not, what else do we need to do to actually incrementally get there, right? But we have to actively reflect and ask ourselves, are we ready? Are we ready? Are we ready? If not, what should we do differently? Where do we need to focus and harden it? Um, so I think those are a few of the different principles that I think kind of come to play when we talk about, you know, how do you apply the principles, which is really a human oriented concept to, to sort of a product development process. Yeah. And I think this comes up a lot in, uh, you know, the principles are, are a result of sort of the human element of software development, so to speak. And, and that human element sort of comes through in a few ways. I mean, I think one is that we, we like to make software that uh, has a, more tightly defined surface area and what it does. It doesn't try to do everything all at once. 
And so Nomad was very focused on being a cluster scheduler. Um, another human element is that we know people are going to use this thing. And so we want to make it you know, as easy to operate as possible, um, fun to use, things like that. And you could see the results of that in, in some of the case studies we published where um, one of our customers talked about uh, in, uh, junior engineer, junior developer uh, upgrading the entire production Nomad cluster. I mean, that's the that's the core system that runs all their applications, and a, and a junior person was able to do that. And that uh, I loved that because that fits perfectly with our design ethos and, and those human elements. And I think the last one with the with the pragmatism is just understanding that people have problems to solve, and you are usually going from a place you previously were towards getting that solution. And so. Um, I think one thing we recognized back in 2015 when we started this project was, you know, containers are obviously the future, but there's a huge number of workloads that are both non-containerized and, and also non-Linux. And uh, that same that same case study I, I just previously mentioned is a very large Windows user, and Nomad was huge to them because it works on Windows. And so I think these are all a reflection of those principles that we believe in. Um, around you know pragmatism, vision, workflows, things like that, in order to build a product that um, is sort of at this point, I guess, like quintessential HashiCorp. Yeah, and I think you know one of the points you raise, which I really like, is when we talk about pragmatism. You know, I think it sometimes gets interpreted as you know really only focusing on on a few narrow things that are sort of like this is the practical you know, thing that the market cares about, right? I think often we get asked like, why does Nomad, for example, support things other than containers? And I think what you you make a great job of pointing out is some of our largest users run non-containerized workloads on Windows, where I think those sort of, you know, you know, the, the market would tell you that, you know, containers on Linux are the only workload that matter, right? And at the same time, I think people would tell you, well, practically, does anyone need to run more than, you know, a few thousand containers? You know, I think people sort of made a whole point out of it when we did this million container challenge, uh, where we ran a million containers on top of, of Nomad. And people were like, well, but is that practical? Does anyone actually need that? And the reality is, yes, we have you know paying customers that run workloads many times larger than that. So I think for us, pragmatism you know, goes beyond just sort of like, what's the common knowledge of sort of the industry and kind of what's hot, to really listening to users, really listening to customers, understanding what they're doing, and really focusing on that as pragmatically, that's their problem, that's their reality, right? So I, I love that point you made, Mitchell. Um, I do want to introduce at this point uh, Yishan Lin, who is the product manager for Nomad, to talk to us a little bit more about what does a 1.0 mean in the context of Nomad. Great, thank you, Mitchell and Armand. While we strive to embody these nine HashiCorp principles in our day-to-day -day work, there are a few of these principles that really stand out in the context of Nomad. One, as we progress towards a Nomad 1.0 release. And two, is how we think about the future of Nomad in a rapidly maturing space with Kubernetes. To build for the future, we have to start from the today. In the past year, the first HashiCorp principle we've really focused on is reflection. We've reflected on how Nomad is used, talking with hundreds of different Nomad users all around the world to learn and understand their core drivers for choosing and adopting Nomad, as well as exploring their production deployments and usage of Nomad in all sorts of industries, from fast food to solar to IoT and to gaming. We employ our pragmatism over the course of this reflection. So we look to really curate the core use cases for what people are trying to achieve when they choose Nomad. And we look to build, strengthen, and refine those core use cases for our practitioners. Every product has a vision but in Nomad's approach, we build that vision from a place of humility. With the growth of Kubernetes in the past two years, we need to be honest on where Nomad fits and uniquely excels for organizations. And last, but certainly not least, we need to be able to execute to get to Nomad 1.0. So let's start with reflection and pragmatism as our first two principles and talk about how those have applied over the course of our development towards a Nomad 1.0. In 2020, we've seen a huge uptick in the number of enterprises that are running Nomad in production. One of the most fascinating observations that we've seen is how practitioners are able to translate Nomad's product simplicity into real, tangible, and quantifiable business results for their organizations. So that means whether we've been talking to large Fortune 500 companies like Citadel or small boutique technical firms like a BetterHelp, 
We find that it takes teams on average just two to four weeks to get Nomad from a technical proof of concept and running into production. The product simplicity of Nomad also carries over into its maintainability as well. There are really remarkable stories that we hear from companies all over the world who leverage Nomad that are able to take very small, lean DevOps teams of just one to four staff members and in turn learn Nomad, pick it up quickly with very little familiarity and background, and then in turn host it, operate it themselves, and service tens to hundreds of developers, deploy and manage up to thousands of applications on a regular basis, achieve higher resource utilization and cost savings, and hit all the business SLAs using Nomad. And that's the core story and tale of Nomad that we hear time and time again, that really resonates with me and the Nomad team every time we get the chance to hear it, is the tale of small teams of very few people who are able to come together and use Nomad to accomplish large and exciting and awesome things in their space. But the story for Nomad this year hasn't just stopped in simplicity and maintainability, but has also extended into scalability as well. Some of the most exciting and largest stories about Nomad's usage this year have come from our friends at Cloudflare and Roblox. Cloudflare is the world's leading CDN who as of today routes 10% of the world's global internet traffic. And they're a company that has built all their infrastructure today on Nomad. Our friends at Roblox are also a great example as well as a company who recently surpassed 150 million monthly active players as the number two largest video gaming platform in the world as a company that has also built all their infrastructure on Nomad today. The guiding product principle for Nomad since its very inception has been to orchestrate any application, containerized or non-containerized. In the past few months, we've explored deployments of Nomad in all sorts of environments from your run-of-the-mill traditional bare metal on-prem data centers to your standard public cloud instances like AWS, GCP, and Azure, agricultural smart farms like we'll hear about from Bowery later in this conference, industrial factories, solar telescopes, and even biology laboratories. The product simplicity of Nomad as a single lightweight binary clocking in at just over 50 megabytes is exactly what enables this diversity of deployment environments where DevOps practitioners are able to look at spaces and industries that are traditionally worked with very physically constrained areas and find ways to deploy Nomad in edge, IoT, and other very innovative ways. Yet no matter the environment that Nomad is deployed in, usage for Nomad fundamentally falls into two core use cases. Time and time again, practitioners call out Nomad's unique simplicity as a container orchestrator and Nomad's unique flexibility in deploying and managing non-containerized applications like Windows applications and Java applications. These two pillars, simplicity and flexibility, are what we've built Nomad around and are this, the reasons and the core drivers for whenever practitioners call out why they use Nomad. By looking back at the roots of what's brought Nomad to where it is today, we can then form a meaningful vision for where the product can go in the future. If we take a quick step through history, we actually see that Nomad and Kubernetes both launched at the same time in 2015. And now that we're five years later along both of the journey of these tool, two tools, and with the growth of Kubernetes, we have to be upfront with ourselves and objective in what Nomad's strengths are, as well as our own limitations. And our vision has to be humble and grounded in real world usage patterns on how people actually use Nomad and Kubernetes today rather than how we think they should use these two tools. In prior years, the conversation around orchestration has been that everyone is standardizing on Kubernetes and that when it's all said and done, there would only be one orchestrator left to adopt in Kubernetes. Yet, as we've covered earlier with Nomad's adoption and other data that we've seen, orchestration has not been that winner take all market. And when we look at other products and other markets and other spaces that we interact with on a daily basis, whether it's software, hardware, technical, or non-technical, we actually see that most markets are run in pairs. Most markets and most spaces are all led by two leading products. And so as some quick examples, wh whether I choose between Dunkin' and Starbucks for a morning latte when I'm on the road and I need some coffee and caffeine to get me through the rest of my long distance trip, or if I'm building a workstation, do I go with AMD or Intel for my CPUs? 
Or if I'm stuck somewhere and I have to get home, do I hail a ride using an Uber or a Lyft? Or if I'm really just trying to add to my already big enough sneaker collection, do I go with Nike or Adidas shoes? At the end of the day, what we see is that in each space, it's defined by two leading products and that each of these products excels at different things. And in many of these cases and situations, it ultimately comes down to leveraging the right product for your personal needs. And what's really interesting is that if we play out the same example, we see that there's cases where markets and spaces hit a peak level of maturity where it, consumers end up inevitably using both interchangeably. So that means when I pull out my wallet these days and I look at my credit cards, I'm looking at both MasterCard and Visa cards. Or if I'm trying to physically ship something somewhere, you know, a box to a different state or a box overseas to my grandparents, I use UPS and FedEx interchangeably. Or when my television remote runs out of batteries and I need to restock and I go to the fridge, I pull out both Duracell and Energizer batteries interchangeably. Markets always have room for a second, and we see Nomad as the alternative and supplement to Kubernetes. It's been 10 years since Twitter first ran Apache Mesos in production as the first major and well-known use of an orchestrator in production. And as a problem space and as a market, orchestration has shown that it's big enough and enterprise needs are also diverse enough that no one tool and no one solution can solve it all. But all product visions need to be grounded and we have to be upfront about where the gaps are for Nomad today so we can understand where we can take the product in the future. Nomad's strength is not in its ecosystem. When we look at the CNCF diagram that really showcases the span of the Kubernetes ecosystem as of today, we see it's this incredible diagram that's ever changing and ever growing of all these different vendors, integrations, and logos that we in Nomad can't easily replicate. And when you throw in things like Helm charts that make it even easier for Kubernetes practitioners to spin up these different integrations, we see that Kubernetes strength is objectively in its ecosystem. And we understand how ecosystem can be a deciding factor for practitioners when it comes to a situation of choosing an orchestrator. Our ambition for Nomad though, is to build a, an ecosystem in a very fundamentally different way. While the breadth and ever-growing scope of the Kubernetes landscape can be really exciting, we think that there's a path to simplicity that we can uniquely carve out with Nomad. Nomad's ecosystem won't ever reach as many logos as Kubernetes, but we do believe we can come up with a simpler, leaner, and more prescriptive path to ecosystem. In the past six months, we've really factored this approach into our development. We've shipped integrations with Prometheus for observability and analysis. We've held a community webinars on how to look on how to hook up Nomad with GitLab CI. And we've partnered with our friends at Datadog to come up with out of the box, consumable, ready to go Datadog dashboards for Nomad practitioners who are looking to get more analysis and observability into their clusters without digging through metrics. And on top of all that, we've built, shipped and maintained our own autoscaler in, in cluster and application autoscaling for AWS. By building for depth and not breadth, we believe that Nomad's ecosystem can be built through strategic partnerships and integrations with one to two of the leading partners from each of these wider e orchestrator ecosystem categories. When we factor in that approach with our existing integrations with JFrog's Artifactory for artifact storage, with CNI and Portworks for stateful workloads, and with Spinnaker, in the CICD space that's coming soon, we believe that Nomad can provide a leaner, simpler, and prescriptive ecosystem for those practitioners that prefer simplicity and definition over comprehensiveness and complexity. Yet we do understand that how our more deliberate, precise, and calculated and measured approach to building our ecosystem may not be a fit for those practitioners that want to move fast and be on the cutting edge of technology adoption when it comes to choosing an orchestrator. As a result of this split, this contrast in strengths, one of the most exciting things that we've seen this year has been the organic emergence of a multi-orchestrator pattern, where large enterprises like Intel, who will have this in their talk later on in our conference, are organically running both Nomad and Kubernetes at their companies, and they're leveraging each of these tools towards its strengths. As we've covered, Nomad's strengths objectively lie in its simplicity and flexibility, its simplicity and easy to operate for small lean teams, 
with very little competence and background is one of its strengths, as well as its flexibility to deploy and manage containerized and non-containerized applications. Whereas Kubernetes strength is a stark contrast in that there's a lot of complexity with Kubernetes, but it comes with a lot of powerful features and an access to a cutting edge ecosystem that is thriving and growing every day. And so what we see is that these companies utilize Kubernetes for the greenfield teams and projects that are ecosystem dependent. They need the cutting edge technology to power the revolutionary use cases like machine learning, artificial intelligence, big data, and serverless. And at the same time, we see this business values there for Kubernetes for these business teams at these organizations. These high value teams and greenfield projects naturally have the high staffing, budget, and the long-term timelines that are needed and often required to support running Kubernetes in the first place. On the flip side, these same organizations take Nomad and insert Nomad for different business teams and projects. And they leverage Nomad in the situations and environments that Nomad excels in with its simplicity. So we're often talking about business teams or projects that are much smaller and leaner sized in terms of staffing and resourcing. And these team profiles can range from anything like a brownfield team that has to build and maintain legacy Windows or Java applications to even greenfield product teams that are trying to build new products for their company that have to work on bare metal. And so we see in these situations that Nomad objectively excels in, like on-prem environmental uh, constraints, we see that there are a lot less dependencies and requirements for that sprawling orchestrator ecosystem in these use cases that Nomad excels in and is getting leveraged for. This is the multi-orchestrator future that we're beginning to see at enterprises, where practitioners are looking at Nomad and Kubernetes like tools out of a toolbox. It's no longer a conversation of a one size fits all of why you should use Nomad exclusively or why you should use Kubernetes exclusively, but rather when you should use Nomad and when you should use Kubernetes and how would you leverage each tool towards its strength in context of your overhead, your resourcing, the people that you have, the workload type you're dealing with and the environmental constraints that you may have on your team. Ultimately, talk is great, but execution is what will matter most and will get us to Nomad 1.0. I'm super proud and excited to announce on behalf of the team that Nomad 1.0 will actually be available two weeks from today on October 27th. As our first major release, Nomad 1.0 embodies a lot of the principles, direction, vision that we've covered today in our presentation. And we're really excited to share more and hope you can join us on the launch event on the October 27th, where Armand will be hosting us all again and walking us through the latest and greatest that's coming in Nomad 1.0. There's a whole slew of new features and major improvements that are coming in Nomad 1.0, but also one really cool and innovative one that we're working really hard on behind the scenes that we can't wait to reveal at that stage. And yet to close, we do have one more thing to share with everyone. Namespaces, which has historically been part of our closed source feature set, will actually be available for all open source users in Nomad 1.0. Open sourcing namespaces means that as a Nomad practitioner, you can natively convert your clusters overnight into multi-tenant clusters, meaning that you can take your compute resources and your existing application deployments and securely and safely segment them across different development teams or projects within your organization. We know that open sourcing namespaces has been a long awaited and much asked request from the Nomad community. And on behalf of the team, we're really happy and privileged to do this as a token of our gratitude and appreciation to those thousands of Nomad users around the world today along with those to come in the future. Thank you all for tuning in today. And we hope to see you all again when we launch Nomad 1.0 on October 27th.